Um, this is the Friday morning uh, committee meeting for House Appropriations. We are um, going, uh, our, our committee has been, has received H6, uh, 611. It is um, an act relating to older Vermonters. And we have today with us Representative Wood and Representative Noyes um, to uh, walk through the bill with us. And we also have uh, Nolan Langwell from the Joint Fiscal Office and Jen Carvey from Legislative Council. Welcome everybody this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful morning, so let's let's just jump right into this bill and um, and and understand uh, the pieces of it. I, Teresa, can you put the bill up for committee members to follow if they have not had the chance to print it off or have it on another device? Okay, uh, we'll do um, a quick walkthrough of the entire bill. I believe it's section five that is of particular interest to this committee. Uh, that's where the appropriation is. And so who is walking through the bill out of the four of you that are here? Jen, are you walking through the bill or is one of the committee members? I'm happy to, or I'm happy to let one of the committee members if they prefer. Um, why don't you go for it? Why don't you go for it, Jen? Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. Um, so you may remember a couple of years ago, the legislature passed um, a bill that created an Older Vermonters Act working group and it set up a group of people to design uh, an Older Vermonters Act kind of modeled on the Federal Older Americans Act. And so they came back with a number of recommendations and this bill really grew out of that. So it starts out in section one by creating uh, the Older Vermonters Act. Um, and I don't know how much detail you wanna get into on this part or if you want me to kind of give a high level and then get, get you down to the money parts. A high level, please. Okay, um, so it sets up this Older Vermonters Act. Um, it starts with a principle, um, principles of a system of services, supports, and protections for older Vermonters, and it talks about um, different principles for a comprehensive and coordinated system of services and supports for older Vermonters. And maybe we'll just go through the numbers there. So there's no, the first one is self determination, and it talks about that. I'll just I'll just really redo the. Yeah. Numbers there, self-determination, safety and protection, a coordinated and efficient system of services. And I'll just flag on this part, this is the first of a few places where this amendment differs from what was originally voted out of the committee uh, because this amendment from representatives Wood, Noyes and the rest of the House Human Services Committee adds in some additional language that recognizes uh, the issues that we've been going through recently in this public health crisis. Um, in the state of emergency. So making sure that there's some references to the particular needs and concerns of older Vermonters and their families when there is an emergency. So that's coordinated and efficient um, system of services. We have financial security, optimal health and wellness, social connection and engagement, housing, transportation and community design, Family care and family caregiver support, and so those are the different principles for um, the the framework for this Older Vermonters Act. Then we get into a number of definitions that are used in the chapter. So I don't know that we need to go through um, those in any detail. And then we have, uh, but they do inform a lot of what uh, the terms that are used in it. And then we get to section sixty two oh four on page seven, great. Um, and that is laying out the duties of the uh, Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living with respect to uh, older Vermonters in particular. It says that they are the state's designated state unit on aging um, and uh, makes them, specifies that they're the subject matter expert to guide decision-making across state government on matters affecting older Vermonters. Um, on the next page, we get into uh, section 6205, the area agencies on aging. Uh, there you go. And um, talking about the duties of the area agencies on aging, also known as the triple A's. And a lot of this reflects things that both Dale and the triple A's do, but it really puts them in uh, statute and 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 creates a greater sense of coordination. Then we have section 6206, plan for comprehensive and coordinated system of services, supports, and protections. 
this uh, really recognizes that that it, that uh, at least once every four years, Dale adopts a state plan on aging, which is required by the Federal Older Americans Act. This puts in some particular parameters about what has to be included and what has to be considered when Dale is adopting uh, the state plan on aging, and also you know consultation with um, various parties. So on page 13, we get to the end of the chapter on the Older Americans, uh, I'm sorry, Older Vermonters Act, I'm used to saying Older Americans Act, and we get into section two, which is an annual report on the uh, Adult Protective Services Program. This really um, reflects the current reporting that they, they are doing, much of which is in response to past legislation. But this is the Adult Protective Services Program within Dale, um, and their job is to um, protect and, and prevent abuse, neglect, or exploitation of vulnerable adults. So this goes on for a, a few pages onto page through page 17 with the details of what needs to be in this annual report on adult protective services. Then section three uh, is on a uh, creates the, the concept of a Vermont action plan for aging well. And it directs the Secretary of Administration in collaboration with Dale and others, um, uh, Dale and Department of Health to propose a process for developing this Vermont action plan for aging well. So it's contemplated as a very stakeholder involved uh, process, but coming up with just the, the development process and reporting on what that would look like. And then in section on, on page 18, we get into the money parts or close. Um, so this is introducing a few sections, the, the purpose of which is to increase the Medicaid rates for home and community-based service providers. So the first thing we have is uh, just a definition section and adding a definition of home and community-based services. So this is defined as long-term services and supports received in a home or community setting other than a nursing home under choices for care. And it includes home, and, home health and hospice services, assistive community care services and enhanced residential care services. So it's broader than just choices for care providers, I believe. Um, section five is the Inflation factor. So this is really the uh, the part that I think you'll be focusing on today. This would have the director of rate setting, which is now in, in DIVA, establish by rule procedures for determining an annual inflation factor to be applied to the Medicaid rates for providers of home and community-based services authorized by DIVA or Dale or both. And the division, being the division of rate setting, in collaboration with Dale, would calculate the inflation factor for home and community-based services annually, according to the procedure adopted by rule, and report it to Dale and DIVA for application to home and community-based service provider uh, Medicaid reimbursement rates. We're on to the next page. Thank you. Um, beginning on July 1st. So they so uh, rate setting comes up with by rule with a process for determining an annual inflation factor for the Medicaid rates and then reports it annually to Diva and Dale so that it can be applied to Medicaid reimbursement rates for those providers beginning on July 1st. And determination of the Medicaid reimbursement rates for each fiscal year would be based on applying that inflation factor to the sum of the prior fiscal year's payment rates, which is um, usually how you would use an inflation factor, but also any additional payment amounts available to providers of home and community-based services as a result of policies enacted by the General Assembly that apply to the fiscal year for which the rates are being calculated. So if the legislature takes action that would increase home and community-based provider rates, um, other than the inflation factor, the inflation factor gets applied to gets applied after that additional payment amount is already applied. And then section six has the departments of DIVA and Dale conduct a rate study of the Medicaid reimbursement rates paid to providers of home and community-based services 
and look at their adequacy and the methodologies that underlie those rates. And then the departments would establish a predictable schedule for Medicaid rates and rate updates, identify ways to align the Medicaid reimbursement methodologies and rates for providers of home and community-based services with those of other payers to the extent those methodologies and rates exist, limit the number of methodological exceptions and communicate the proposed changes to these providers of home and community-based services prior to implementing any proposed changes. And by April 15th, 2021, Diva and Dale would report to the Human Services Committee, to this committee, and to the Senate counterparts with the results of their rate study. Then section seven creates a self-neglect working group um, that would provide recommendations around adults who because of physical or mental impairment or diminished capacity are unable to perform essential self-care tasks. And there was a definition in that older Vermonters Act section. Um, and this working group would be headed by the commissioner of Dale and it specifies a number of uh, members of that task force. It does not provide any um, per diem. So most of them are uh, either state employees or they're people acting in their official, largely acting in official capacity. So it does not specify any per diem. And then finally, we have the effective dates. Um, and so the, uh, the Older Vermonters Act part, most of the act takes effect on passage um, with some minor exception relating to the state plan on aging. Um, but for your purposes, sections four and five, which are really the ones with the Medicaid rates for home and community-based service providers and that inflation factor would take effect on passage and apply to home and community-based service provider rates beginning July 1st, 2021. So the beginning of the FY22 fiscal year. Thanks, Bill. I just have one quick question about the, the study group. Um, do we have to provide the language for per diems even though someone may even though the entire group may not be eligible for them i'm just wondering if we have to put in the language for per diems i don't believe so if you don't put in any language for per diems there are no per diems well but what i'm saying is is there anyone who could be swapped out or are all of these they would never require a per diem that's my question if they um, so there i mean the we can i can go through the member the membership is is um dale employees vermont attorney general or designee state long-term care ombudsman or designee executive director of the vermont association of area agencies on aging these all have or designee um Executive Director of COVE, the Community of Vermont Elders. Sorry, page 22, perfect. Um, Executive Director of the VNAs of Vermont, Executive Director of Disability Rights Vermont. There is an elder care clinician, so that person is not employed by a, an entity that would be um, performing in its official capacity. Um, the Director of the Center on Aging at UVM College of Medicine. So, I mean, I think it's a policy choice for you whether you choose to put in per diem language or not. There is not a requirement that you pay per diems. And my other question is when it's a designee, it, the designee could absolutely be any person they chose to put in. Um, it, it doesn't have to be related to the group. It could be a person of knowledge that the group has. So that's true. there could be people who, would uh, need per diem. So um, I'd like to, that's a, uh, we can open that up for discussion later with the committee, but um, are there questions for Jen or um, for um, Teresa or, or um, Dan or Nolan? Uh, actually, before we um, do that, let's have Nolan walk through the fiscal note and then we'll open it. Dave, is that okay if we walk through the fiscal note quickly? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Hello, good morning. Uh, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, you may hear my dog growling at the UPS guy. We're uh, used to Mary's growling, bud. Um, he's a good watchdog like that. So 
Um, so, uh, so the fiscal note focuses on section five, and that's the one where the the, rate, the Department of Rate Setting or the Division of Rate Setting at DIVA establishes the procedures for determining an annual inflation factor that would be applied to the Medicaid rates for the providers of home and community-based services. Um, and then it, and it has it apply it once the effective date goes in. Uh, this language, it would not increase spending in fiscal year 21 um, because of the timing of it, but there would be an increase in the base spending starting in fiscal year 22. Um, that said, um, we can't determine at this time what that inflation factor would be because the Department of Rate Setting hasn't actually done the work because it's in the law for them to actually do the work. So we, so Dale had no way of estimating what that could be, but I did look at what had been done previously and um, there had been a 2% Medicaid increase for fiscal years 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, uh, and that every, uh, by calculation, every 1% increase in the rate is roughly $900,000 gross. So although in 2022, we don't know what the fiscal impact would be, it can be assumed it's probably going to be more than 1%. Um, and as a result, the fiscal impact would likely exceed $1 million gross to the extent that the increase is greater than 1%. Um, so in, again, in, in summary, no fiscal year 21 impact, um, 22 impact, but unknown at this time. And it's a traditional Medicaid split? It would be the traditional Medicaid split. Thank you, Nolan. So are there questions um, we can jump back and forth between uh, Nolan with the fiscal note and the bill. Dave, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, Jen, where in section five and section six does it actually say that the uh, rate, the inflation increase shall be granted? I understand it says the Division of Medicaid shall develop rules for calculating one, and it talks about a study uh, in section six, but can you just point that out to me, please? Um, well, I think it's implied in the, um, I mean, you're, you're right, it doesn't specify that the that Dale and Diva then apply the inflation factor. I'm just looking at the language. Uh, well, no, it does actually. It does, so in C on page 20, so on page, mm -hmm. page, so on page mm -hmm. 19, the director comes up with rules for coming up with the inflation factor. And then on page 20 in subsection C, determination of Medicaid reimbursement rates for each fiscal year shall be based on the application of the inflation factor to the sum of the prior year fiscal year's payment rates and anything else that the legislature had um, provided. So that, that explains how it should be applied, but it doesn't say in statute or in the green books that it shall be applied. I don't see where it says that. It says it shall be calculated um, but it doesn't say the state of Vermont shall on an annual basis grant an inflation in fact, uh, factor to these providers, does it? Uh, no, but I don't think that's the way we do it in nursing home rate setting either. Mm -hmm. but, um, so I think to, to me in saying determining the rate, the, the reimbursement rate shall be based on applying the inflation factor to last year's payments and anything else that was appropriated comes up with this year's Medicaid reimbursement rates. I mean, it can't require the state to actually appropriate that money. You have to do that through the annual so, appropriations So is it, really saying, is it really saying that if through the appropriations process, one shall decide to grant an increase, this is how it shall be done? Um, I think it's saying this This is what the Medicaid reimbursement rates will be, but it's always dependent on the legislature actually appropriating the funds for that purpose. Okay, so I don't, I don't read it as, as compelling us to do anything, but, but I guess you're saying it does, even though it doesn't say that. You're saying- Well, you can't compel, mm -hmm. you can't Go compel ahead. a future legislature to do it. I mean, that's, that's the- that's always the issue. You can create the, the framework for it, but each year's budget has to actually appropriate the, the money to fulfill that requirement or notwithstand that requirement. 
Madam so, Chair. Well, I, I'm sorry. Go, go, go ahead, Teresa. I still have questions for you. Okay, I just Please I just wanted to. I don't know how things work in your committee. That's why I I put up my. No, I, no, I see the hands. I was just waiting for Jen and Dave to finish. But if you can help clarify this, Teresa, that would be great. I I think. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that the um, Dave is getting at um, one of the original reasons why there was some um, uh, deliberation about whether this was going to come to appropriations or not. Um, and because it doesn't compel an appropriation, um, it compels a process and then leaves the appropriation up to the normal appropriation process. So. Um, that that was the original deliberation about this, um, uh, you know, back in March, uh, and so it went back and forth. And I think you know the speaker decided to err on the side of caution and send it to appropriations. If it if it creates an expectation, and it's done exactly the way the nursing home inflator is done, I'm wondering if a precedent has been set, and then that expectation would be would be expected to be realized that's that's my concern yes and we were not expecting um in in section five um for that to be similar to the nursing home rate study that is that is actually more in section six to de devise a process to establish um you know uh, a methodology for um uh, for establishing rates, which frankly, there isn't any right now. Um, it's just historical and it's, it's really not based on cost. It's not based upon anything um, other than history. Uh, and so section six seeks to establish a process that um, would uh, really look at the, the costs associated with providing home and community-based services and uh, establish a procedure for that. So the section five um, is not intended to be like the nursing homes. That's just, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Section so, six is very clear that it's a report, a study and a report back. Yeah. Section yes. five gives, I, I don't have a comfort level with the exact intention, but Dave, did you want to finish please? I'm sorry. I Thank you. No, don't be so, gosh, no. Uh, I, I, yes, just to follow up on that. So if I, if I were working in the agency of human services, I don't think I would, turn to my budget people and say, gee, we've got to put in the budget an increase here because it says so. I think what I would say is if we're required to do one, here's the procedure and the process that needs to be abided by. That's what I hear. I think I hear Teresa saying. Um, so that to me is less onerous than um, you shall be compelled. And I'm not sure, I, don't, I, I should know. Uh, what the nursing home language says, but I don't, uh, we'd have to do a side by side. I don't see a precedent there too. I just wanted to shift to another area, if I may, uh, quickly, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yes. um, uh, Dan and Teresa and uh, anybody else on the, uh, your committee who, who's there, um, I don't see in this bill anywhere, and I may have missed it, um, some kind of acknowledgement that given we're one of the, we are the most rapidly aging state in the country, that um, some type of sustainable funding will need to be um, created to help the entire aging network. Is that, is that in the bill anywhere? Do you address uh, that? Uh, that is, that specifically, Representative Iacoboni, um, is not in the bill. Um, we did focus on Medicaid services in this bill, not on the full array of supports and services um, that are uh, available to Vermonters. Uh, we, we focused on those things that we um, currently have a, a direct appropriation to. Well, yes, and, and even that one would think would be very strained as more and more people age, just the Medicaid portion. Um, but. It's just my observation. I'm, uh, Dan, did you? Dan, did you, you wanna, do yeah. you want to clarify? Um, okay. So you, I think some of that will be addressed in section three when we do the Vermont action plan for uh, aging well. So um, we tried to think about a long-term plan for aging in Vermont and what services will be um, you know, important as the population uh, demographics change. So 
I think a lot of that will come out of this um, Vermont Action Plan for Aging Well. Um, and, you know, in future legislation, you may see some uh, additional um, needs that need, to, you know, that have to be met. So was it intentional on the committee not to talk about the uh, design possibly of a long-term care trust fund? Was that, was that discussed and uh, was decided that wasn't something that's needed or is it just an omission? So no, I, uh, I'll, I'll address that. Um, you know, I, we, the, I don't believe the committee had any in-depth conversation about it. I did talk to, um, you know, I talked to Ann, uh, our ch chair about it. And uh, I think we did not, um, we did not include anything about that in the bill. Although I think it would be a, a good thing at some point to, to think about. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dave. And I see we have another member from Human Services. Kelly, I don't know if you were when we started, but welcome and uh, just join in. Either raise your hand or use your flush hand or your blue electronic hand if you uh, have anything to add. Nice to see you. Um, I have um, Bob and then uh, I thought Marty's hand was up. I have Bob, Mary, Peter. There. How's that? <clears throat> Bob, it's good. So, yeah, all right. I I don't want to sound like I'm down on seniors. Just take a good look at me, and uh, you'll understand why I, I am not. Even though I will never uh, be on a program like this. However, I just want to bring to mind everybody's attention to our financial situation at this time which isn't expected to be any better next year. And I don't know why you would think it would be better in 2022. As a matter of fact, I almost think it's gonna be as bad as it is. It's not gonna be any better. But anyways, I, I'm gonna be supportive of this, but I need, I need somebody to be aware of. We, we just cannot, we can't spend 10 cents right now even though we by doing this we are setting ourselves up for that and that's all i'm saying be careful thank you and i'm all done thank you bob um teresa did you have a response to that or something to add at this point uh, I, I actually did um i i think what um representative helm brings up is an important very important um factor and um I just want to give you, a, I guess, a real life example of how this plays out in real life every day. Um, so there's a retired physician in my community who um, took care of her mom for many years with the assistance of um, activities at the Waterbury Senior Center. And then she also attended uh, Project Independence. Her mom had advancing Alzheimer's and for um, five to six years of that advancement, um, this physician was able to take care of her on her own, you know, with the very small assistance, like I said, from adult day, um, and did that for five or six years at home. Um, she finally was um, admitted to the Woodridge Memory Care Unit um, for the last um, year or year and a half of her life. Um, but, but we saved literally hundreds of thousands of dollars by having her be in the community being cared for at home when she was eligible, you know, six to seven years prior to that for nursing home level of care. And it, this, is very, this is very real in terms of its impact on our economy in Vermont and the strain that it could put on our economy not to do this. And, um, I can give you a, another real life example. Project Independence has not survived the pandemic. Project Independence is an adult day service that has served hundreds of people in the Washington Orange County area. And those are individuals, many of whom have significant memory issues. Um, they have significant adult care issues. They are cared for at home by families, uh, except for when families need to work or need a, a break. And that adult day center um, has been a victim of COVID-19. And 
uh, we do not yet know what that impact is going to mean on the nursing home population um, in central Vermont. Um, and uh, I just want to caution the committee about being, you know, what, what I would really call as penny wise and pound foolish. The administration has not um, put, and it doesn't matter if it's Democratic or Republican, <laughs> the administration has not put um, the support of these private nonprofit providers, many of whom are very small, adult day providers are really small, triple A's are really small, has not been on uh, the priority list to address the financial situation of those providers. And if they fall apart, um, if you think you've got budget problems now, um, the cost of serving somebody in a nursing home is significantly higher, and I know you know all the numbers, um, than it is to have that person stay at home where they are um, much happier. And I might add, um, not isolated like they are right now. Um, you know, the people in nursing homes, residential care facilities have not been able to see loved ones for three months now, going on three months. And they're gonna be the last ones to <coughs> do that. And if they were at home receiving that support, um, they would have been among their family members. Um, so I'm just, I, I, sorry, I got a little passionate about it. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Um, can, can I make one statement? Yes, Bob. The only point I wanted to make is I believe, and I get it, this is government. You cannot compare government to business in a situation like this. However, I believe we are sliding to a point of possible insolvency and government can massage that a little bit better than business can, but it's still there. And when it's there, it's hard to get rid of. So I'm just, that's all I'm saying. Bear in mind, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Hear you. Uh, uh, Mary. Thank you. Um, one, one of the real liabilities of being on the appropriations committee is you see great bills like this. And I really think this is important, significant work that is helping us understand and support a community that we have to support. And that, but the liability is you go, oh damn, how do we pay for this? How, how, how do we balance that? And that's our job and we'll, we'll figure it out. But I, I just, um, I, I think all of our thoughts are going to the, hear my dog? How do we do the balancing act? Sorry guys. Um, and, and as I said, we'll sort that out. The specific question that I had was around the issue of of how the rates are set. And I've, I think it was in section five where Dave was asking about the, not Dave, Jen reflected that this was similar to what we were doing in for nursing homes. Can, I was wondering if Jen or Nolan could tell us, one, is it the same language? And two, what has been our historic um, approach to, if it is the same language, what has been our historic behavior around that? So it, it is not the same language. Um, there is a, a quite an extensive process, both in statute and in rule for uh, nursing home rate setting. Um, I, and I, are you asking, have you appropriated the money to meet the, the nursing home rates that, that were identified? Is that the historical question? Yes, and let me just try to flesh that a little bit more. Dave was suggesting it doesn't say you will appropriate it. And I, I get the point about we can't compel future legislators. Um, but I think we have historically appropriated money to nursing homes, regardless of, we've, we have felt an obligation. And I am wondering if this is creating the same, ob, the same sense of obligation. So I think in the, my understanding, and I'm not ver well versed on the, the fiscal stuff. So I would look at Nolan or Maria if they have been 
more involved in that. It, I haven't heard the same kind of concerns raised um, by stakeholders about the about nursing home rates in the sense that that there's a process and it's my understanding that the process is uh, is it seems to be followed. Um, I'm not sure I I'm not sure I know much more than that. I don't know from the nursing home side whether they view the rates that are are created through the statutes through the statute and rules as um, sufficient. I think you would hear may hear different things from different folks on that. Um, but there is a quite an extensive set of statutes and talks about the factors to be taken into consideration. And there is a an inflation factor. Um, it's it's a very extensive system, and so what is set up in the bill is not does not mirror the extensiveness of that system, but it does uh, create the idea of an inflation factor and address Medicaid reimbursement rates as incorporating that inflation factor. Again, always subject to the the uh, authority of the legislature to appropriate the funds or not. Nolan, do you have additional thoughts? I believe uh, Nolan had to leave. Oh, no, you're there. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 did to, too. I have to sign off like in like 30 seconds, but I, I don't really have um, much more to add. I think it just comes down to how is it going to be interpreted in 22 in terms of spending? And I don't know the answer to that. And, and I think it's um, important that it's very clear, whichever way we go, that, they, that, it, that it doesn't leave any vagueness that when it when it leaves this committee, it's clear with the intention um, that the committee chooses for it to have. Uh, I have Peter, Diane, and Marty. Thank you, and thank you for coming in. I, this is important work. Um, Dave Dave um, posited a good idea early on that I think would be very helpful to us if we did have a side by side comparing the uh, uh, this to uh, to what we do for the, the nursing homes. And I know that there's a lot more. Uh, that, Jen is, is alluding to the robust uh, nature of statute as it pertains to nursing homes and their rates, and there's rules behind it. But just to, to give us a, a sense of, of how this could develop, I think that would be very helpful to me. And, and I would really, really want to see that, number one. Number two is, is just a question and, and, uh, th that I have about the, about the bill itself. And I scanned it. I'm sorry I didn't read the bill. Um, I was unfortunately involved in a situation where elder abuse occurred. Um, I, uh, this was about five years ago, so it may have changed by then. We contacted Dale um, and, and asked for assistance and got exactly nowhere because there wasn't enough. Uh, there wasn't enough, even though the individual who was doing it actually had a record. Uh, there wasn't enough linkage there or something like that. So is there anything in this bill that will actually work with the attorney general's office to strengthen our laws to ensure that, uh, that, that situations are thoroughly investigated uh, for appropriate adjudication? So um, Dan, chime in if, uh, or Kelly too. Um, there's a, a couple of different areas that um, would apply to that, uh, Representative Fagan. Um, the first is the broad plan for aging well in this state. Now we use positive terms because that's what we want right, to do. Right, right. Um, but uh, that the reason that that sits in the responsibility of the Secretary of Administration is that that is intended to be broad across government. So it's it's intended to encompass emergency management, the state's attorneys, the you know any um, you know public transportation, you know, all of those kinds of things that, um, you know, we all would want in our communities as we um, hope to age well here in Vermont. So um, that would be something that would be included in that area. Um, the other area that we specifically are codifying in this bill is around adult abuse uh, protection reporting. Um, you may recall um, a few years ago, uh, Dale was being sued by uh, Legal Aid and the um, um, Disability Rights Vermont um, around their, um, well, it's just, it, it was a whole bunch of things, but, you know, their um, reversal of substantiations, their, their rate of investigation, the, the number of vacancies they had, in the, and so they had a uh, 
a significant reporting requirement for a period of time that expired, um, frankly. And uh, we felt in our committee that it was, this is a significant enough and an important enough issue that that should be a permanent requirement um, for adult abuse. And so it would give us as legislators, um, not on that sort of individual granular level, but as a systemic way to look and see, are, are we making progress um, in this area? And then if, if not, then we can work on fine tuning the laws. Gotcha. That, Thank that's you. correct. Thank you. And, and did and you want to weigh in? Did, yeah, just quickly, we did change some of the laws around financial exploitation of older Vermonters a couple years ago. And uh, so, you know, those are currently in place right now. Good. That That's weren't exactly. I, I want to say it was probably two years ago that we we increased uh, the ch put some changes in there. So good because that's that's what it mainly surrounded. Thank you. Yeah, we there was some instances where um, someone it wasn't a felony or it, it wasn't criminal if you sold Correct. somebody's stuff. Correct. So that's been changed. Oh, thanks. I have uh, Diane, uh, Marty, your hand was up and then it's down. I'll come back to you, the chip and back to Dave. Diane? Diane, for some reason, we're not hearing you. Sorry, sorry, I pushed the wrong button, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. So this is an area that I have had just a little bit, but I'm nowhere near an expert in this, in this field. But, you know, on the budget line items, I, you know, we see in our committee when yearly the, the nursing home rate is, is right there every year um, for us to consider. It could be anywhere from two to $3 million increase a year. However, in their defense, they'll say, but the, the, the nursing home days that they're not getting paid for now pretty much almost balances that out. So you'll see their rate being increased and then you'll see the next very next line is a reduction because of the, of the wonderful work in the community services over the years of having um, the placement there. So it, it might be up $2 million by law and then down a million and a half because of reduced nursing home days, which is, which is unfortunate for their business plan, but very good for our seniors because they're, because they're shifting to the choices for care. What used to be, you know, a, a, a very large amount nursing home at a very, and we have not kept, meaning the big we, we have not been able to figure out a way to create balance and equity among all those systems. And I'll just, this is really my question, is we're talking about a Medicaid population. We're not talking about providing something. This is a Medicaid population that goes to Bob's point that we have to, by law, provide these services. This isn't an option of doing something nice because, you know, but it's about a Medicaid population. And we have in Vermont, particularly, figured out a way to be able to provide that mandated service much more um, efficiently and economically. And then we have not been able to, able to keep up with being able to figure out how do we fund it equitably. And that's basically, so I just, can somebody, Nolan or so, we are talking about Medicaid population, correct? Yes, you're talking about Medicaid rates. Right, so this isn't, this isn't something not optional. We're either paying for it in a nursing home or we're going to pay for it in a different way. We should examine the, the mo most effective and economical way and equitably fund it. Just saying. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Thank you Diane. Um, I'd, Marty, your hand was up and then down. Do you have a question or a comment? Okay, I think we're going to chip. Uh, thank you. I have a question for Jen, I think, and then uh, maybe a brief comment. Um, so Jen, the, the bill um, requires rulemaking to determine how the inflation rate will be determined. Um, but that's as far as it goes. And then, but the fiscal note is created, must be assuming some, some, I don't know, standard way of arriving at a, at a, 
inflation rates. I'm just, I guess my question is, even though we're kind of leaving it to, to be determined, is there sort of a pretty standard way of going about that, that we could, we could actually have a, create a fiscal note um, for the, for 2022 in this case, that's, that's somewhat accurate? So is your question, is there kind of a, a standard way of coming up with an inflation factor so it's not a, that narrows yeah. the universe a little bit of, of what kind of numbers you might be talking about? Yes. Um, it's a good question. I'm, I, let me check. I know Nolan had to get off the call. So um, let, me, let me check in with our fiscal folks and see, um, hey. and see if they have a, oh, and maybe Representative Wood has a take on that. Teresa? Um, uh, Nolan, um, I believe uh, from our conversations, calculated what he did in the current fiscal note based on uh, essentially a, a simple percentage of what we have for long-term care, home and community-based services, um, and uh, not his knowledge of what we have previously done. Um, what rate setting, uh, the reason that we have this, um, are proposing this with rate setting is that uh, we don't know if they would do something based upon a medical consumer price index, whether it be a regular consumer price index, whether it would be, you know, some combination. Um, I, we wanted a, we didn't want to mandate a certain procedure in law because, frankly, we're not the experts on it. Uh, we felt that um, it would be more appropriate for rate setting to do that uh, deeper dive to determine what method would be most appropriate for this with, of course, public input as you have in the rulemaking process. So that makes sense to me that we would leave it up to people who have a better, uh, more knowledge about what the proper way to go about it is. I just wonder what that means in terms of the possibility, the range of possibility for inflation rate that might be determined. Um, but I, I would expect there to be um, public uh, comment on that, including from legislators. So, um, uh, for instance, you know, it, we don't know what the economy is going to do. You know, if, if we have inflation that, you know, tops out at six or 7% or something like that, um, I would imagine that we'd be seeking as legislators some sort of, you know, cap on what the inflation could be. Um, but I, I think um, Nolan's sort of, um, you know, rough cut at it in terms of what, you uh, each percentage does is roughly a million in gross dollars. I, I mean, that's as, that's as probably as accurate as we could get in terms of what we know now. If we were just uh, using the same method as what has been used in the previous three fiscal years when the legislature said, okay, we, we need to do something here, um, let's, let's do 2%, and then they calculated that based on total cost essentially. Thank you. So my, so I, I just have a, I guess it's a comment and the and kind of the reason I was asking about the inflation rate um, is, and, and I should say, you know, my history on that appropriations committee is short and uh, so I don't know how these things generally go, but I, I was reading this language in section five kind of over and over again, sort of in response to Dave's looking at it. And, and I think, as best I can tell, he's right. It doesn't require anything to happen, but it it certainly seems like it is very clear that the the rate will be calculated and it will be implied applied, and that we will have a reimbursement rate for Medicaid um, that will I, I assume be presented to us. That this is this is the Medicaid reimbursement rate. Um, what we do with it after that, you know, is, is always our determination to do. But it, I, I guess I'm just saying it will set, it certainly feels like it would set an expectation that that will be the rate going forward. Um, and, and if we decide not to do that, we're going to have to decide that every, every time we appropriate money to say, no, we're not going to do that, or yes, we are going to do it. Um, so anyway, that's my comment. So when and if this bill leaves the committee, there, there has to be complete clarity what the expectation is. Either we're setting in motion uh, a rate increase or we're setting in motion uh, policy and uh, study work. We, we cannot, we cannot <clears throat> put a bill out that is not clear 
on what the impact will be. And I just want to bring to the committee's attention that there is some confusion, obviously, around Section 5. But to bring to your attention the second paragraph of the fiscal note, which our committee will be working off from and we would use when we go to the floor, it is written that there would not be an increase in 21. There would be an increase in base spending in 22. So on the fiscal note that we are working with, either this has to be corrected or the language needs to be fixed, but there's not clarity here. And before a bill can move out, our committee needs to know if we're putting pressure, uh, financial pressure on a, on, a, a future, on a future budget. And granted, we, you know, a future legislature cannot withstand, but our intention needs to be very clear when we get to the floor that either yes, we agree to increased um, an increased um, uh, an amount for the base funding, or no, we're not voting for an increase in any amount to base funding. We're supporting the policy and the study work because the information before us is a is in conflict a bit. Um, Dave and Teresa, Teresa, did you want to respond to that before I go to Dave? Okay. Uh, Dave, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll be I'll be brief. I know the clock's ticking here. Um, I, I was director of rate setting for a number of years, albeit it was a number of years ago. Um, but a brief history on this: there, what drove the um, requirement to give nursing homes an annual increase was something called the Boren B O R E N. It's very boring. The the Boren Amendment. Uh, in Congress that was that was established in 1981. It was established in hopes to be a cost containment mechanism, but the courts interpreted it broadly that all nursing home rates at the time should pay what were deemed uh, reasonable and adequate rates to operate an efficiently um, run facility, something to that effect. Vermont in 1990, I think 1997, uh, and Vermont's law uh, essentially paralleled what the Fed said. So that's why the nursing homes got their annual increases. For at that time, with the passage of Act 160, which started uh, significantly the uh, home-based uh, movement, um, an effort was made to amend the so-called Vermont Foreign Amendment statute to sufficiently weaken it to uh, give more latitude on that reimbursement. Having said that, however, the, the commitment to provide the annual nursing home increase is in statute and the, the few times that I recall that we did notwithstandings, if, if Jen were to, and she may have already done this, I don't, if you were to go back and look at what they notwithstood, you would see in the nursing home law what, what built that annual inflation increase. And that would help us, I think, do the side-by-side um, that I think is necessary in order to determine whether Nolan needs to amend the fiscal note, not being critical of him, he always does great work, but he said he made a determination based on somebody that this compelled the rate increase. Now, I, I want to be clear, I'm all for the rate increases. I just don't think this language compels it, but I, I think there's more to be done to help us come to a conclusion. And I, I agree with what you were saying, Kitty. Thank you, Dave. Teresa, your um, blue hand is up. Um, I just wanted to um, mention, and I, and I think Dan's going to chime in here. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, we we took this bill back to committee um, and developed the amendment, and um, we naturally wanted to include. Um, it, it seemed like a a glaring oversight to us about uh, not addressing emergency and health crisis, but it seemed very obvious now. Um, but uh, we put specific language in there. Um, and then we, we obviously talked about this appropriations process and what that meant and considered whether our amendment should remove section five or not. Um, and uh, I think Dan wants to share uh, some of the comments from our colleagues. Thank you, Teresa. Dan? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so we did have quite a discussion about Section 5 and the intent. Um, and this is once we heard that uh, there was a fiscal note being required and that it was going to come to the Appropriations Committee. And we did have some discussion about just removing Section 5. And one thing our committee unanimously supported 
um, leaving this section in and uh, having it come to this committee because we felt strongly that um, you know we need to support the agencies that are providing these services to these individuals, um, especially when we look at the impact um, that the current emergency is having on them. Um, because if they weren't there, it would uh, it would be hard. And as Teresa stated earlier about Project Independence, um, you know these home and community-based providers. Um, we just wanted to make sure that they were adequately funded so that during a uh, time of crisis, they're going to be able to provide those services to the individuals. So, you know, our committee really did have a, a discussion about just removing section five and sending it to the floor. And um, I, everybody on the committee felt strongly and that's why all their names are on this amendment. So yeah. it was actually, it was actually fairly, um, comical um, because Dan and I were just going to present the amendment and uh, some of our most um, what we might call our most conservative members of our committee said you know wait wait this is so important I want my name on this bill on this amendment mm -hmm. and uh, you know to a person uh, you know they they all said we want our names on this that's how strongly we feel about it yep. so Thank you. So, so I, I just need to be clear. They, they all felt strongly um, that the policy and the and the study and the report all need to move forward, or they also feel strongly that the inflator be put in place. They also feel very strongly that the inflator be put in yeah. place. They were very clear about um, they were very clear about that because we, like Dan said, we had uh, a serious discussion about just taking section five out um, and leaving it with the study. And um, it, it was actually some of our more conservative members said that we can't do that, um, you know, and we, we have to bring this, we have to bring this forward because if we don't bring it forward, nobody is going to. Um, so just, I, I want to um, remove the conversation from from the bill at hand and just, just give a, a brief explanation of the landscape that we're in so that we're not, it doesn't sound like we're targeting older Vermonters in this sort of work. And so between um, the time we get out the quarter year bill and we come back in August or September to report out a fiscal year 21 bill, at this time there's a $265 million gap. And so um, any bill that has spending that is not, that is ongoing dollars, because that's important. There, you know, there's always some overage somewhere to, to address you know, a, a one-time need, but these would definite be, definitely be ongoing dollars that would build annually year after year. And, and, and I'm just talking generally now, and I don't wanna target any specific bill, but there's a $265 uh, gap that we need to close. And so anything that we pass that is ongoing in nature would be a priority above any other spending at this time in state government. It would not be, it would not be considered against any other, well, it would be, it would be considered against anything else that we would have to reduce or systems reform and changing things to get to, to get to balance that an appropriation would be the top priority. And, and that's what I have to make sure of that with having to find 265 million and that number could change once we get the consensus forecast in August that this, that this or any other bill is the top priority for state government. And that, and that's what we have to reconcile, and 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 you know there's ve there's a very many important things, but between now and uh, putting out a, a 12 year budget in the late summer and fall, um, you know we're we're there's it's likely we're going to have systems reform, and I am wondering if there's work that can be done between now and that bill coming out that would. Um, find things that are less of a priority and substitute this in for the ongoing dollars. If this is the top priority, mm -hmm. one lesser priority that could come out, knowing that you may have to find 
$20 million in savings, you know, and I'm not, and, I, and I'm not, I'm just throwing a number out there, but when the number is 265 and, and human services spending is 50% of our state budget, a lot of, a lot of attention is going to be in that area. And so I just want to make sure before any decisions are made that we fully understand the priorities of, of the legislature and of our committees and of this committee. Um, so that's the, that's the dilemma that we're facing. And, and so, you know, it, it puts us in a quandary for many things. There's so many good pieces of legislation that, that need to be passed, but now we have to start prioritizing, okay, if this is where we need to go, what are we doing that is less of a priority that we can substitute it out with? And also what is a lesser priority that doesn't get substituted out because we have to get to zero by September. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, th I think um, we certainly um, definitely appreciate the, the huge amount of uh, work and, the, and the, the enormity of the task um, in front of uh, your committee. That is, is definitely something that weighs on all of us. And I think, um, you know, the thing that I would say, I guess maybe in parting words about this bill is that I think that this actually assists with that problem um, because if we don't do it, um, we will have increased nursing home expenditures um, that will add to your problem. Um, and I think that this will help your problem, our problem. I mean, our appropriations are all of our problems. So, um, but yeah, I realize you have to set the priorities. Um, and no, 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 the, 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 the policy committees are going to help us with our priorities. Well, yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, I, we very much appreciate the, the yep. partnership. <laughs> um, I, I think that the, the thing that we find ourselves in is, a, is the situation that, uh, Representative Lamford spoke of earlier in that the the major systems reform for this population has already occurred um, when we shifted from an institutional bias to a um, choice bias that uh, and we're more, more and more and uh, most people now the vast majority of people are choosing home-based services so that that big um, systemic change to uh, shift the tide of how we would um, allocate resources into the future in Vermont has has really occurred for this long-term care system. Thank you, Teresa. Are there any other final questions from the committee? Um, the committee will have discussion, and I have you know I have no idea where the committee is going to go on this. I I, I certainly understand the importance. Um, if if it goes if if we agree that the inflator needs to be there, we need to make sure that the language. Uh, reflects that. If we feel the language does not reflect requiring an inflator to happen, then the, um, the fiscal note needs to be corrected so that the information jives on both sides. Um, if, by, if we choose that the money is not available to be committed at this time, it does not mean it's a dead issue. It means between now and August to look at the revenues of the state and and reprioritize other things that are being funded and remove those and uh, put a new plan forward to you know do a, a systems reform based on what are the the most important items within uh, budget areas to be um, to be implemented and go forward for Vermonters because they are going to help the most and they're the most critical um, appropriation that we can make to Vermonters at the time. And, it's, and I just do have to re reiterate, it's not just substituting out, we also need to find $265 million at this time in reductions, knowing that number can change. And the outlook for 22 um, has not looked that rosy. We may learn something differently in August. I don't mean to be a downer, but I just need all the cards on the table so we know how they can be moved around to make um, a, a set that that does what we want it to do for state government. Thank you. We we appreciate the realism. Yep. I'm tired of the realism. I know. I know. <laughs> um, are there um, any other questions? 
thank you so much for for coming in thank you. Uh, all on the house floor in 25 minutes and um let's just have a committee discussion and i need to go grab a kleenex quickly <laughs> thank so, you thank you so much for coming in thanks for having us so let's just wait for kitty to come back i'm sorry yeah no worries no. Guys, for that, um, and and so as we as we continue, um, you know, I, I think that's going to have to be the theme. And I don't, you know, I don't want us to be the bearer of, of bad news all the time. But you know, there is still a substantial amount of money in in state government that we are appropriating with all funds, you know, around six billion dollars. Um, I don't know if this brings it down to five point nine something with whatever the gap is going to be, there's a significant um, amount of money that still will be appropriated. And I think it's important that this is the time that we work with um, policy committees and, and really identify priorities and what system reforms can happen to take best advantage of, of the money that we do have. We can't focus on the amount we're losing. We have to focus on what do we what do we have and what's the best way to spend it that that's a i think a much more positive approach than you know what are we going to cut what are we going to cut um you know what are we going to do to support uh vermonters in, in the best way we can diane and then dave so thank you so i would put this in the when we talk about our our different vehicles this goes in the system reform, but the system has been reformed. This goes in the system reform payment reform. This is mm -hmm. about payment reform in section five versus the system. So I, I could see where that goes in that bucket. Yep, and uh, in order to pay for it, what comes out? You know, that, that's, that's the other piece, you know, where, where does the money come from? Right, and, and or what, what balances it? What comes out on the other side that's that it's in balance of? It's right. there's an inequity now, and I don't know if the answer is taking the sandbox away from others so that everybody's equitable or making the you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. well, if we have this money to work with, that's all the money we have to work with. And so do we fix yeah. it? Yes. Uh, you know, it really has to go back to priorities and 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 right. expending the most important first. I agree, and that's where all the committees and everybody. And if they, if there's a, if there's a consensus in this state and in our legislature body that this is something that makes sense, then much like what Dave said, we're that doesn't happen in our room. We have to stay within the box that we have to spend. But if there is a desire to make this system work in a payment reform that may make the money look differently for this particular like system payment change. Do you see what I mean? Yes. That's not not necessarily our room's decision. It's the bigger body's decision. Well, it are, it is our room's decision what is appropriated in the right. end that gets to the body for the bigger decision and they can vote that down. Yes, they can vote that down. Okay. Dave and Mary. Um, you know, in the end, it may all be uh, budget neutral, um, but do we want to come to agreement to ask Jen, it may be implied, and she may have already done it while listening mm -hmm. in, but um, if she could do some type of side by side and come back to us and say something to the effect of committee, I've looked at this and I am 101% positive. It is a commitment to increase funding in the future. I don't see how the administration could ignore it unless they propose a notwithstanding. Uh, or she might say, um, uh, you're right, it's not a commitment. And if you'd like me to revise the language, um, I can do that for you. I'm just wondering if we don't do that, um, the bill will be on the wall and that may be the committee's choice, but it, it won't, it won't come to an end one way or the other. 
Um, I, I think you're right about Dave. I want to put out like uh, like a few options on the table uh, so that I, I get a sense of where the committee wants to go. So that would drive the work that Jen would do. But but we have to have some clear. We we need clarification on 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 the language depending on the direction that we choose to take as a committee. Uh, Mary, uh, Dave, were you finished? I don't mean to. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mary. Mary, you need to unmute. Sorry, guys. That way you didn't have to listen to my dogs try to, you know, they were awful. Um, I'm back on the systems question. And the dilemma that I believe the Human Services Committee has is that this system floats between them and the Healthcare Committee. And honestly, I think we need to be also looking on the healthcare side about what are the opportunities and the changes and how we have to behave in this new regime. And I just wanted to say that while I can see that Teresa and Dan are still here, maybe Kelly is too, but I, I think we have to make, our, make fundamentally hard questions about our healthcare spending and are we doing our healthcare spending in the right place? Uh, and should could we be spraying up some money over there to bring into the community, which I totally agree is the right place to go. The second kind of systems question I have is just wondering what, what has this whole pandemic revealed to us about both the nursing home or congregate-based provision of care versus um, the more community-based provision of care? And do we need to be standing that on its head? And I, I really hope that the um, human services and the healthcare committees will pick up that, those questions and see what the opportunities are there. Doesn't help us with this bill right now, but I think it's the fundamental question we have to solve. Thanks. Uh, Chip? Um, a couple of thoughts. One, um, I mean, I, 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 tr I trust Dave uh, implicitly to know kind of what this kind of statutory language might or might not require of the administration. Um, but to me, the plain reading of it just leaves no doubt about at least the first step, which is when you get to letter C, it says determination of Medicaid reimbursement rates for each fiscal year shall be based upon on application of the inflation factor. So whatever, whatever the administration takes that to mean, I think, you know, the public advocates, whoever will, there will be an expectation that that's what's going to happen. And, and whether or not we, you know, follow through and, and apply those rates, they will have been established. They will have been determined what they should be. Um, so, and I, I'm not taking a stand what, either way about whether we should go ahead and do that or not. I'm just saying, to me, the language is pretty clear about at least, at least up to the point of the administration's actions, um, what's going to happen. Um, the other thing, you know, and this is really, really stating the obvious, but um, you know, if we're if one option is to think about systems reform, is there any, and, and to Diane's point that much of this has probably has been done over the, over the years and even recently, but, you know, could, if we set the, uh, the um, effective date back on this section, you know, can Dale come back to us with um, uh, at least an argument for why increasing this rate would help drive down the spending on nursing homes and to say that it we may be budget neutral um, in a way that's actually sort of more just, you know, to, to increase these rates. Um, I mean, I guess I'm just looking for it to your point, Madam Chair, about not having any money to spend right now, but trying to figure out where we go in the future. Maybe we can ask for an analysis of whether or not that would likely to be budget neutral if we were to do this going forward. 
Um, even even if it's budget neutral, there is still um, a, a big gap that we need to fill, and, um, and and so when we put all the pieces together of all of state government, whether you're talking about ANR or you know any you know human services or public safety, um, all the pieces have to fit together to get zero. And so I, I see we have uh, like four choices here. We can leave the bill as it is and accept it or not accept it. Um, section five, um, we can write it to determine, yes, there will be an increase so that there's no ambiguity. Or section five can be written as it's informational only. Um, or we can remove section five from the bill. Um, and then if, if, if it goes back to the, the second, um, the second option where we, we want the increase no matter what, that's a top priority. Uh, we have to figure out how to how we're going to adjust that to all other spending and we really can't do that until August because we don't have um, the ability to know ongoing money at this time and um, I, I do not I, I do not believe that we have sufficient information. To um, to pass a substantial a substantial bill like I mean this is up to the committee without the information without a consensus forecast to um, to know where it's going to fall unless we determine this is the top priority for state government and, and then you know it's our job to make it happen. Um, do Marty. Based upon those last comments, I agree. We need to. I would. I would see section five. I would much. I would like to clarify what the language of section five means, whether it's compulsory or informational, and my preference would certainly be that number five, setting in motion the calculation of an inflator factor, would be informational only and then leave that up to the legislature and the administration to determine whether it actually goes into a proposed budget or not. I, I think it's valid to look and see if the rates should be increased and, and whatever those factors are they use to compare them for other things to say, yes, we need a 1% increase on these particular rates, but I do not want those, that to be compulsory. I think that should be information then that the administration would use and ultimately the legislature would use to determine whether to increase those rates or not in any given year, depending upon what the, the fiscal requirements are for that year. So I would like clarification on that point on number five. As it stands right now, which way which way it means, whether it's compulsory or just informational based. Thank you, Marty. Um, can I get a sense of um, where other committees, what other committees or members are thinking? The um, it, we have eleven minutes until we need to be on the floor, and we also need to put together a schedule for next week, a Zoom schedule. And uh, we also have to remember to wish Linda best wishes on her. Yeah. That is. Coming. And we expect her right back as soon as possible. And we need a little bit of a break. Yeah. <laughs> now I, I neglected to lay out my shirt and tie this morning, so I was, okay. was not going to go in and disturb my lovely bride. So what I would like to do then is, I, 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 I the, the bill has been clearly laid out. We have our fiscal note. I'd like committee members uh, to think about the direction that they would like to take, and then we'll see where the majority of, of members want to end up with this bill. Um, for um, for the, the schedule next week, if we keep it kind of in the, in the uh, lanes that we have been keeping, does anyone have a conflict that they know of next week uh, other than Linda? Linda, you will be out. Your surgery is, we're not meeting Monday, it's Memorial Day. Linda, you're out Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's that's what I'm thinking. Hopefully, the surgery is Tuesday, and I don't get out of the hospital till Wednesday. So I don't think I'll just run back from the hospital and sit down here with you guys. I, I don't think so. And you may need Thursday and Friday too. Yeah, Thursday and Friday for me. 
but best wishes with your surgery, Linda. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else have a Kitty. comment? Yes? Kitty. Uh, yes? Uh, yeah, I have a Tuesday, I have a 11 o'clock Zoom appointment. Not here. <laughs> okay, uh, 11 to 12. Well, yeah, 11 until it's over, probably 11.30-ish. Okay. Does anyone else have a conflict next week? And Teresa put together a schedule. Um, okay, then we'll work between house floors and other committee meetings. Uh, again, Teresa, Dan, thank you for coming in. I think Kelly's jumped off. Jen, thank you. Um, we don't have time be before the floor, and Peter needs to get his day on. So, um, I, I believe uh, we, we are not planning on coming back this afternoon. Would the committee like to continue this discussion on Tuesday or would you like to come back this afternoon and sort it out? <laughs> Tuesday's good with me. And I have, uh, that's one for Tuesday. Uh, let's two, just- Two for Tuesday. If, if you agree with Bob on Tuesday, could I have a raise of hands for Tuesday? One, two, three. Okay, and the, put those hands down. Is there anyone who would like to come back this afternoon? And and okay, this gives you the weekend to look over the language, and um, we'll, we'll where we're doing. speak where we're going. But again, thank you for this thoughtful work and um, sort it out. See you on the floor. Thank you. Hey, I'm gonna stop the live. Okay, Teresa, you'll help me.